Now, as we've been trekking through this series on five things every Christian needs to grow, we've been talking about and preaching through this idea of, of Bible study and how important and central it is for us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we started out in 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter says, like a newborn infant or baby, let us desire the sincere, unadulterated, uncontaminated word of the Lord that we might grow up into our salvation. And so we learn that God's word is, 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 is essential for us, uh, just like a newborn baby needs its mother's milk. Then we, we looked at Matthew chapter 4, where, uh, and we looked at the famous uh, uh, passage that highlights Jesus' temptation, where Jesus is tempted by the enemy um, in the wilderness, having just been baptized by his cousin John. And Jesus comes in the wilderness. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan tempts him to turn bread, turn a stone into bread. And Jesus makes the awesome statement, which is a quote from Deuteronomy that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Peter told us that the word of God is like milk to a newborn baby. Jesus says that the word of God is like bread that comes from God. And then last week we were in Hebrews chapter 5 and we looked at uh, Hebrews uh, 5 and around verse 11 through uh, chapter 6 and verse 3 where the writer of Hebrews exhorts us and challenges us with his frustration that, that, that the people that he's writing to um, were still on milk when they should be on solid food. So Peter said the word of God is like milk. Jesus says, quoting Moses, that it's like bread. And then the writer of Hebrews says that the word of God is like solid food. And so we've looked at this whole idea, this, these analogies of the word of God being bread, milk, and food. And then, so tonight we want to we want to challenge ourselves with this idea that we shouldn't blow off what God has breathed. And so we want to ask the question, what does it look like for us to blow off the word of God? What happens in our lives when, when we disregard or think little of the word of God? And I think Paul is here in prison and he's writing to his son in the ministry, Timothy, who's a young pastor, kind of like myself, Paul is in prison, and this is Paul's final communication with Timothy. He says to Timothy, come soon, I want to see you. Uh, he's not sure whether he's going to be executed by the emperor Caesar or whether he's going to be freed. Paul is on house arrest waiting for uh, to have his day in court, and so he's concerned about whether he's going to see Timothy again, and these this is Paul's final communication to Timothy and probably one of his final letters that he wrote. And so Paul is giving these last words, his last will and testament to Timothy. And it's interesting that in chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2 and on through chapter 3 and verse 4, that Paul is focused on the, the essential nature of the word of God. And I think oftentimes we as as Christians, we don't really have a high regard for the Bible. Sure, we bring it with us to church because we think pastor is going to preach from the Bible, but the, but the Word of God doesn't have a permanent abiding place in our life when we leave here. Sure, we, we, we pull out our Bibles, and I want you to pull yours out and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, but the question is, does God's Word have a place in our life when we leave here? And if it does great. If it doesn't, then why not? That's the question that we want to ask. That's the, that's the place we want to get to, and Paul is reminding Timothy here in this passage to be focused on the Word of God. So turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 10 through uh, verse 4 and, and 5. We're going to it seems like a lot, but it, it won't. We're going to jump around a little bit. And the two things, the two things that I'd like to talk about tonight. Paul exhorts Timothy to do two things, and I kind of want to encourage you in much the same way. Two things. Paul exhorts Timothy to continue in God's work, and then Paul exhorts 
Timothy to continue in God's Word. And I'd like to commend you to God and ask you to do the same thing as well, to continue. Some of us get started and then life happens and things happen to where we discontinue. We, we fall away, we give up uh, on, on the trek that we're on. I think a lot of us, when we first came to faith, we got really excited about the Bible and then as the euphoria of our faith kind of waned, we, we kind of fell away from our passion for the scriptures. And Paul wants to challenge Timothy not to allow that to happen to him. So the first thing is Paul wants to ex exhort Timothy to continue in the work. And so he, there's a call to remember here. Paul wants Timothy to remember. Timothy, I want you to continue in the work that you started, but I want you to remember three things. And let me just outline that. Paul says, to remember my example. Look at what happened to me when I was doing God's work. The same thing that happened to me, Timothy, you can expect to happen to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul says, but you have followed my teaching my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love and endurance along with the persecutions and suffering that came to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So here... Paul says to re remember my example, Timothy, that if you want to do God's work, you're going you're gonna to suffer persecution. Paul was, was uh, adversely opposed at Iconium and at Mystra, and, and, and the, the, there was such a ruckus stirred up in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter uh, 13 and 14 that Paul and Barnabas were kicked out of Iconium. I mean, can you imagine being expelled out of a city? It's one thing to be kicked out of a restaurant. It's another thing to be expelled from school. Have you ever heard of someone kicked out of an entire region or a state? You're not allowed back here anymore. And Paul is saying to Timothy as a young pastor, Timothy, that as you do God's work, you're going to experience persecution. And, and as we're a new church six months in, and as we commit to doing God's work, we can expect to endure some hardships as well. There are challenges that will happen in our families and on our jobs and in our communities and in relationships that will try to prevent us or short-circuit short our desire to want to do God's work. Maybe it's not full-fledged persecution, but just some difficulties. You know, you got to come to minister and the kids get sick. Or or you're on your way to minister like what happened to me a couple of weeks ago and your starter dies on your car. Remember that? I mean, things will happen. Why? Because Satan knows that you're fully invested and committed to doing the work of God and he wants to get between you and the work. And so Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, when these things come up, remember the same thing that happened to me happened to me will happen to you. So expect that. If you desire to live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. And so Paul is just really adamant about, about that. The other thing is, is Paul tells them to also remember that God is your judge. God is going to judge our works. And so look at uh, chapter 4 and and, and verse 1. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Look at this. Paul says to Timothy, he says, Before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his, in, in his kingdom, I solemnly charge you. He says, look, Timothy, the reason why you want to do a good job in ministry is because when you stand before God the Father and God the Son, they are going to scrutinize your ministry. See, that's the reason why we shouldn't shuck and jive when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing for God. That's the reason why we shouldn't belittle or, or not take serious the work that God has called us to do. Whether it's singing in the praise team, whether it's 
uh, being one of the musicians, whether it's being a greeter, you're on the financial team, you're a part of the sound, you, do, you, you work the camera, whatever it is that God has called you to do in ministry, we ought to take it with the utmost seriousness, whether God is challenging you to lead and, 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 and to lead out in missions, whatever it is, we need to pour our heart and soul into that because Paul reminds Timothy, when you stand before God, God is going to scrutinize your ministry. He's going to know whether you've persisted in your ministry. And, and so Paul says, Timothy, I'm charging you, I'm commanding you to be diligent in your ministry. And I would like to convey that same exhortation to you. Whatever it is, remember, when you stand before the judge, the judge, that God will remind you and scrutinize and talk to you, talk to us about our ministry. Some of us are going to receive some awesome rewards as a result of our ministry, and some of us are not going to get any credit at all because we didn't work hard. We weren't diligent. We didn't give God the best that we had. And so, and 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 look, that's happened to me too. There have been times and instances where things come up, and I can't pour my heart and soul into the worship or into the sermon the way I'd like. School is big, like this week I got a huge paper to write, 200 page book to read, and all of it's due by Thursday. And so I'm thinking, well, man, I mean, how do I get done with this? I mean, ask Trevor. I mean, the load at school is heavy, and how do we do it all and do what God has called us to do too? I don't know. I'm, I'm pleading and asking God to maybe give us a, a couple extra hours in a day. Like if we could move the time around, if we could get 26 hours in a day, I'd probably be pretty good. Because I'm always roughly about an hour or two behind. So if we could pick up a couple of hours, that would help me out tremendously. That's not going to happen. I've got to work with the 24 that I have. I'm expecting a couple of all-nighters this week. Well, I just don't make it to bed at all. And my wife probably would like that because I snore really bad. So um, she'd probably sleep better those nights. So that would be, that'd be awesome as well for her. Um, but Paul is saying to Timothy, look, man, God is, son, God's going to scrutinize your ministry, so you want to do well. And then Paul challenges him in verses 2 and 5 of this same chapter 4 to fulfill his ministry, to, to really go pedal to the metal with your ministry. Look at what Paul says in verses 2 and 5. And I know I'm jumping around. I, I had to do that to try to find some synergy. Generally, I start at the beginning, but I had to jump around this week to make this work. So... Um, look at what verse 2 says. Paul says, in fulfilling his ministry, Paul says, proclaim the message, persist in it, whether convenient or not. Rebuke, co uh, correct, encourage with great patience and teaching. And then verse 5, he said, but as for you, keep a clear head about you, about you in everything. Endure hardship, do the work of, of an evangelist. And then the final statement, the final command is fulfill your ministry. Fulfill it, Timothy. Finish it. Go to the finish line with your ministry. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Go all the way to the end. I mean, we've seen some really awesome stories of, of people that were running a race and got injured in, you know, in the midst of that race, but they crawled to the finish line. Or somebody came and carried them so that they could cross the finish line. You've seen that happen before, right? What a moving instance when that happens. Because there's something valuable, there's something virtuous about crossing the finish line. If you've started the race, there's virtue in finishing the race and in ministry and doing God's work and, and staying focused and committed to what God is calling us to. Things happen. And we lose track of, of where we are, but God wants us to finish the race. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy here. So, he tells him the first thing he says is, Timothy, continue in God's work. Now, what does that look like for you? What are you thinking about as you hear Paul's exhortations to young Timothy, a young guy who's starting out in ministry, who Paul has mentored and trained, who's now pastoring one of the churches that Paul planted at Ephesus. And Paul is in prison, and he's hearing about what's happened uh, at Ephesus. And Paul wrote first Timothy to help Timothy correct some of the issues, some of the negative things that were happening at Ephesus. And now Paul is writing a second time to him, and he's saying, son, keep it up. You're doing a good job. 
be diligent, be persistent, stay focused on the task, finish the race, you know, teach the word, rebuke, correct, do all the things that you need to do as a pastor. And at the end of it all, Timothy, complete your ministry. So what are you thinking about that as your exhortation about what God is calling you to do? I want you to kind of get the gist of that same. I want you to get the flavor of what Paul is saying to Timothy and forget that he's talking to Timothy and pretend that he's talking to you. Because the reality is Paul is speaking directly to Timothy, but indirectly he's speaking to us as well. And so he's challenging us to remember a couple of things. Remember Paul's example. Remember God is going to scrutinize your ministry. And remember to fulfill your ministry, complete the work. Now, the second thing Paul exhorts Timothy to do is to continue in God's word. And we want to look at uh, four things here. We want to look at we want to look at the um, the stat the statute that Paul gives Timothy gives him a command. We want to look at the source of Scripture. We want to look at the significance of Scripture, and then we want to look at uh, abiding or our our sustainability in the midst of opposition to God's word. So the source, the statute, the significance and the sustainability. Look at what uh, Paul says in verse 13. Back at, back, at, back at chapter 3. Back at chapter 3, Paul says this about the Word of God. He says, well, let's start at verse 14. We'll come back to verse 13 later. Paul says, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed, knowing those from whom you have learned and that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul says, Timothy, you must continue the imperative. The imperative, the statute that he gives him is to continue. Timothy, continue in the things that you've learned and that you've been assured of, the things that you've been convinced of, knowing that the people that you've learned them from, me, your mentor, Paul, you've also learned the scriptures from your mother and your grandmother, were your mentors in the faith before you met me, and Paul and, and challenges and, and, and commands Timothy to continue in what he's learned and been assured, assured of with regard to the word of God. And we've, we've heard uh, the gospel preached, we've heard God's word taught and preached in churches our whole life if we've been in church for a substantial amount of time but Paul wants us to continue in that and continuing and persisting and being diligent and making the word of God a priority is something that you must do with intentionality because God's word will, will end up on the back burner if you're not careful especially during football season or especially during the time of the season when the NBA playoffs are coming on and the games are on every day on TNT and ESPN they go back and forth it's easy for you to get lost in Bible study when the games are on or now if the ladies aren't watching TV uh, the basketball or the football then you know they've got their shows that they TV on. you know we gotta keep up with the Kardashians we gotta know what's going we gotta follow along with Chloe and Lamar. We got to watch 19 kids and counting, you know, or hoarders or buried, hoarding buried alive. You know the shows that we watch, Weird Science, or is it, is that what it's called? That's one of my wife's shows. Is it Weird Science? What kind of science is it? What's the name of that science show you watch? You don't watch a show that's got science on it. These freaky guys who look like they're in, from the 70s. Big Bang Theory. Oh, yeah, that's it. I know it had something to do with science. Anybody Big Bang Theory people? Um, so we got these shows that we watch, and that kind of stuff can crowd out our time to devote to the Scriptures. And so don't think, well, why is Paul challenging Timothy to continue? Because life happens, and the Bible is the first thing to go. And so that's the statue. It's to continue. And then the source is, look at what he says in verse, in verse 16a. 
Paul says that all Scripture is inspired by God. In other words, the Bible has its source, has its origin in God himself. God breathes out the word of God. This is its inspiration. All the Bible translators translate this as inspiration, but in the Greek it's really God breathed. In order for God to breathe in something, he must first breathe it out. Expiration is necessary and then inspiration is possible. So God must breathe out his word. And then look at what, look at what uh, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 with regard to the inspiration of God. Peter says this. He says, first of all, you should know this. No prophecy of scripture comes from one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke or wrote, I might add, from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the scriptures are, are come to us as their source and their origin from God. Now, one of the objections we hear quite a bit is that people that are skeptics of the Bible or of Christianity or of our faith say that I don't, they don't put too much credence in the Bible because men wrote the book. Don't, don't quote the Bible to me. Don't talk to me about the Bible because men wrote that book. Kind of like men wrote the Quran and, and other religious books. But Peter makes the case, and here Paul says that the, word, that the scriptures have been breathed out by God and breathed into the hearts and minds of holy men who wrote and spoke as God compelled, kind of propelled them along, gave them the words that they might say. And and so when we blow off the word of God, when we belittle and we disregard the word of God, we're inherently saying, God, you're not important. Now, that's a tough pill to swallow. That's tough for me to say because when I'm not diligent in the scriptures, I'm, I'm not even concerned about what you think about that. I'm concerned about, about what I'm doing. And even as a pastor, one of the challenges I have and that most pastors have is that the only time most pastors really study the Bible is when they're preparing for a sermon. But we should be studying the Word of God for our personal benefit in addition to what we're studying to get ready to, to share with you. And very few pastors do that. And if they're honest, they'll, as I'm being honest, they'll admit that. A lot of pastors only pick up the Bible when it's, when it's time to share, to do Bible study, or to prepare the sermon. They're not reading for their own personal edification and, and, and strengthening. Not at all. So when we blow off this God-breathed entity, we're saying, God, you're not important. We're saying that your, your mind... Your thoughts, your will, your way is kind of not important. I'm going to kind of do this thing on my own. Now, none of us would ever say that to God, right? That, those words would never parse our lips. But our actions speak louder than our words. God searches our hearts and he sees that his word is not a priority to us. And God, and Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, Understand that you've got to make the word of God paramount in your ministry because God is the source. He's the origin. These words are about him. They're not just about random things. Which is why when I teach um, the, the overview of the Bible, one of the things I focus on, especially in the Old Testament, is that God is the main character in the Old Testament. It's not David or Moses or Abraham or Jeremiah or Isaiah or any of the prophets, the main character in the Old Testament is God. He's on every page. So when we study the scriptures, we're saying, God, you're valuable to me. You have an, you have an inherent worth and dignity. We're going to be talking about that when we come to worship. When we, when we worship, we're, we're magnifying God. We're saying you're worthy, you're you're invaluable, you're special, and I'm, and I'm going to give you my attention in, in these songs and in my meditation. And that's even true. Bible study is worship. 
Now, we love a good tune. We love our worship tunes. But we kind of take or leave the Bible. Shame on us. Because studying the scripture is just as much worship as any song that we sing. Because God is a source, and that's what Paul is reminding Timothy of. So the statute that he gives him is to continue in what he's, what he's learned and been assured of. The source, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures come from God himself. He breathed them out and into the hearts and minds of holy men who wrote them down for our benefit. Now, the significance is in the second half of verse 16 and on into verse 17. There are seven benefits to the Word of God. Look at them in verse 16b. We'll just read all of 16 again. Paul says all scripture is inspired by God. And look, he says, and it's profitable for seven things. The first one actually goes back into verse, verse 15. He says the scriptures which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The first thing the scriptures are good for is leading us or challenging us or putting us in a position to be instructed with regard to wisdom to salvation so instructing for salvific purposes you don't come to faith in Jesus Christ apart from hearing the Word of God so the scriptures have made you wise unto salvation Timothy by faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior the second thing is the scriptures are profitable for doctrine or for teaching for godly living if you want to know how to live a godly life, if you desire to want to be like Jesus, then being rooted and grounded in the scriptures is absolutely essential. God gave us this book in order that we might be conformed to his image and his likeness so that we'll be less and less like who we are and more and more like Jesus. There's no better resource that God left to us than sacred scripture and we need to know that it's profitable for teaching us how to live like Jesus and then the third thing is it's beneficial for rebuking or for challenging us when we sin or convicting us of sin and we need that you know we become jaded in this society there are so many things that are considered okay in our society and what's great about the Word of God, the Word of God tells us when we've gone wrong. Because even though our favorite TV show or the, God, or the people that we hang around with say, man, don't worry about that, I do that all the time. The Word of God says, oh no, that's not acceptable for Christians to do. But we've got to get into the Word of God and allow it to convict us of our sin and our unrighteousness and our iniquity. We need that. And oftentimes we don't, we don't always have the support group or a peer group that will hold us accountable for, the, for what God says. And so when you don't have that sort of accountability group, the Word of God will show you when you've gone wrong. The fourth thing is the Word of God is profitable or beneficial for correcting that. Not only does God tell us when we've gone wrong through the Scriptures, but the Scriptures also tell us how to repent and get back and, and get back on the straight and narrow. So, and we need that as well. God doesn't want us just to sit in our, in our remorse and our regret for having sin. God wants us to get right, to repent and say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to do a 180 and I'm going to walk in a different direction. Lord, I wasn't honest on my taxes in 2012, but Lord, in 2013, I'm going to be honest, even if I owe the IRS. I'm going to do the right thing. God is a God of another chance. He gives us another opportunity every day we wake up to right the wrongs and to right the ship. And I love that about God. And we need to see that the Word of God is God's number one agent, along with the convicting work of His Holy Spirit, to lead us back to repentance. And then the fifth one is, is God uses the Word of God to, to, for training, for us to be sustained in godly living. Not only is the Word of God able to teach us how to live like Jesus and 
show us when we've gone wrong and show us how to do it right, but how to, how to stay on the straight and narrow, how to persist in godliness. Not to have these up and down seasons where we do well and then we go through this valley of, of deep, dark sin and then we come out of it and we're walking with God again and then we fall in the way. I, we have these, these mountains and these valleys in our walk and God wants us to just, just be just the flat line and just to be consistent in our walk with God. And the Word of God is, is beneficial for training us in sustained godly living. And then um, at the end of uh, verse 17, Paul says that the word of God is also profitable so that the man of God may be thoroughly, may be complete and equipped for every good work. And there are two in verse 17. The second one, the sixth one is completing. God wants you to be complete. He wants you to be fully qualified and equipped and fully adequate and prepared to do God's work. So number six is being fully qualified to do God's work, and then to be equipped and to be adequately prepared to do God's work. Now, those might sound interchangeable, and I want to just show you that they're not. It's possible for you to be fully qualified to do something but not adequately prepared. I heard a couple of weeks ago uh, 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 a Ph.D. talk about how how he failed one of his uh, exams to get uh, his master's degree in, in psychotherapy or, or, or therapy um, psychology. He failed it six times and passed it on the seventh time. Now, he was fully qualified having gone through his master's program to take that test, but he failed it six times. That's why they kept letting him take it, because he's qualified, but he hadn't prepared for the tests. So it's possible to be qualified to do something but not be adequately prepared. And Paul is saying that the man of God needs the word of God if he's going to be adequately prepared and completely uh, qualified to do the work that God has called him to do. And that's what God wants for us. God wants us to be prepared and ready to do, to do the work of God but if we don't get into the Word of God, what we do for God will flop and flounder. And, and the Word of God's got to be our motivation for why we do what we do. It's not because they're counting on me. You know, that's one of the motivations that drive, and that's not inherently bad. Accountability and community is, is, is really cool and necessary. But we've got to be driven, we've got to be motivated, we've got to be called because God has said to us through his word, this is the area that, that I want you to serve. This is, this is the ministry that I want you to be a part of. This is the difference I, I believe you can make for my kingdom and for my church. The motivation that's got to come from the word of God. So what have we looked at so far? We've looked at the statute. Paul commands Timothy to continue in what he's believed and been assured of. Then we saw that, that the source of Scripture is God himself. He breathed out these words in the holy man who wrote them down and spoke as they were moved by God. Then we saw, just in looking at this passage um, here, that God wants us to, to see the significance of his word. And then, and then the sustainability. God wants us to, to persist or to sustain ourselves in his word in the midst of opposition. You know, there, like I said before, there are things that are going to come up and God wants us to persist in the fact that people will come against us as we make God's word a priority. Look at verse 13 of chapter 3 again. Verse 13 of chapter 3. Paul says this. He says, evil people and imposters will become worse. Deceiving and being deceived. And I like Paul's next statement. We read it already, but it ties in verse 13. Paul says, but as for you, Timothy, continue. Continue in what you've learned and firmly believed is weightier when it's contrasted with evil people and imposters who, who are growing worse, who are 
deceiving and being deceived. Paul tells Timothy the reason why we have to persist in the word of God is because we live in a day and an age where imposters and and, shuck, and shysters are taking the word of God and making it say things that God never intended. And if we're going to if we're going to sustain ourselves in the midst of opposition to the Word of God, we need to know what God's Word clearly says and what God intended for it to say. Not for us to say what our pastor said or what your mentor said or what your Sunday school teacher said, but what does the Word of God have to say? Paul is warning Timothy that there are a lot of people that are going to be coming into your church, Timothy, as a pastor, and these people have been deceived and their motivation is to deceive others. And so we need to really be focused on the Word of God because deception is a very real problem in the first century church and it's a very real problem in our church today. The other thing we need to see is that not only will people deceive and be deceived, but there also will arise uh, an intolerance for sound teaching. Over at chapter 4 and verse 3, look at that with me. Paul says, For the time will come, Timothy, when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. See, the churches where, where sound doctrine is being taught, where what there's look and I want to make this abundantly clear no matter whether you hear me preach at Acts or at Victory Christian Fellowship I'm never going to tell you something new so if you've got an itch to hear something new you don't ever want to come when I'm preaching because I'm never going to tell you something new because there is nothing new see every pastor every bishop every evangelist everybody's got a revelation everybody's got a new word for you and everybody's receiving everybody's word that's because we have an itch to hear something new and I'm telling you up front I'm never going to tell you something new because there is nothing new all I'm going to tell you is what Paul said and what John said and what Moses said and Isaiah said and David said and what Jesus said I'm just going to tell you what they said and I'm sorry if that doesn't tickle anybody's fancy. I'm not interested in blowing smoke. It just doesn't fascinate me. But if I, if I post it on Facebook and if I tweet it that I had some new revelation, we'd have a lot more people here tonight. Because people are drawn to novelty. People want to hear something they've never heard before. And I'm telling you up front, you'll never hear that from me. Now, there could be a, a, a different nuance to a passage maybe that you've never considered. Maybe I'll show you another side of it. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uncover or reveal some details that maybe another pastor, another teacher has never highlighted before, but you'll never hear some new thing from me. And if any time you hear a pastor say, he's got a new word, he's got a new perspective or he's got a new doctrine then, then that's a clear indication to you that's, that's the call to go in the other direction that's dangerous and Paul is telling Timothy Timothy people are going to leave your church at Ephesus because they have itching ears and they want somebody to tickle those ears so they will we'll encounter an intolerance for sound doctrine not only will there be an intolerance for sound doctrine, but people will exchange good, sound, biblical teaching for myths, for fables, for lies. Look at what he says in verse 4. For they will turn away from hearing the truth of God's word. It will turn aside to what? The myths. And so we want to be careful. Uh, we were just talking about this um, out at Biola. They're, they're doing a conference, a two-day conference on Israel, the church in the Middle East. And I wish that I could have went to that, that uh, conference. One of the things that I heard this week that really troubled me is this, 
whole idea, and you can Google this, this whole idea of uh, this uh, faulty theology that's called supersessionism. And I didn't really know what it was by that term. Once, once the professor lectured uh, in our exegesis class this week, once he unraveled what it was, I knew what it was. But just to, to hear that supersessionism is picking up ground troubled me. And supersessionism is simply this. It's the idea that people in the church are making the case that the church has replaced Israel as God's, as God's people. And so the church has superseded Israel, that God is no longer working with Israel, that God doesn't have any future plans for the nation of Israel at all, that, that, the, that the church is now the people of God, that we are now God's chosen people. And that is a lie right out of the pit of hell. And Christians are peddling that all over. I mean, there are even people at our school that, 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 that fall under that category. And I just don't understand what Bible they're reading. Now, as they quote scripture to you and as you hear that, that could be an area where you might think, oh, well, maybe that's true. There are these, these ideas, these theology, these, these doctrines that are out there that are fundamentally false. That's a myth. Right now, God is working with Jew and Gentile in the church to be one church, one body in Christ. But God does have a future plan for the nation of Israel. God is going to do a work and he is going to sit on David's throne one day in the nation of Israel, in Jerusalem. Jesus is going to be seated and rule on David's throne. That's clear. So if you run into this supersessionism nonsense on the Internet or you hear somebody from another church who's, who's had somebody come in to teach that, reject that out of hand. It's nonsense. So I'm saying to you that that even in today's church, not just in Paul and Timothy's church, but there are doctrines that are being taught in churches by, by good believing Christians who believe the word of God, but they're wrong about that issue. Fundamentally wrong. I asked my, I asked my wife who's Jewish, I said to her this week when after that lecture, I said to her, I talked to her about, about the lecture and I asked her if, if she would have married me if I was a supersessionist. And she said, absolutely not. Now, my wife doesn't know what it is, but once I explained to her, she was offended by that because Jews believe that God's not done with them yet. And I would say that there's a host of scripture that validates that. So, so look, folks, we've got to continue. We've got to persist. We've got to sustain ourselves in our endeavor to be what God wants us to be in God's word. So let me give you that exhortation then ask you about Coram Deo. How do we, how do we put this into practice um, in God's presence and before his face? With regard to our head, first of all, we learn through three faculties. God works with our head, he works with our heart, and he works through our hands. So as we think and as we rationalize uh, the message tonight, one of the things we got to come to grips with is that we must get serious about God's word in our life. Then we can fully, we'll be fully capable of doing God's work knowing that God will judge the work that we are rendering on his behalf. We got to get serious about the word of God. We've got to get into it and we've got to get it into us. That's where our thinking has got to be. And in our hearts, as we reflect and as we contemplate, have I blown off what God has breathed? Have I blown off the word of God or the scriptures not a high priority in my, in my week to week operation as I live my life? Have I blown off what God has breathed out? Am I susceptible to deception? If I heard about supersessionism before Pastor Darrell mentioned it, and there were a host of Bible verses supporting the position, 
Would I have been tempted to believe it? Do I have itching ears? Do I, do I listen to podcasts and radio broadcasts and stuff on YouTube that, 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 that boasts novelty, that, that says it's some new teaching? Do I have itching ears? Those are rhetorical questions. I can't answer those, but as we contemplate where we are with that, that's when we lay down at night, these are the questions that ought to ring out in our hearts. And then finally, with my hands, what do I need to do in order to get serious about the Word of God? I need to spend quality time reading my Bible and diligently seeking to understand what I've read. See, God doesn't want us just to read. He wants us to understand what, what we've read, what we've studied. And so I want to make myself available to you as you look at pages 27 and 28 and five things every Christian needs to do to grow. And as you begin your study, if there's something that you just don't understand, then my job is to help you get it. But I don't get any emails from anybody. The, the last email I got from anybody that wanted clarity about the Word of God, Derek called me and, and emailed me a couple of weeks ago. Nobody calls me, so uh, I'm assuming that you're using somebody else as your resource, and I'm totally okay with that, but use me as your resource. I'm available, and I don't want you to think, oh, well, Daryl said he's really busy. No, my responsibility is to make sure that you understand the Word of God, and so I'm making myself available to, to help you get it so that you can be drawn closer to God because that's really what it's about. I said last week that we study the Word of God, we're focused on God's Word, not just for head knowledge or so we can be Bible thumpers. There's no virtue in that. We want to be drawn closer to God. We want to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So we delve into the Word of God so that we can become more and more like Jesus. That's what it's about. And I want to help you in that process. I want to help you think through the issues. What's going on? Why is this happening? Why did, why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus blow off his mother in John chapter 2? When Jesus asked Jesus, when, when Jesus' mother asked him to turn water into wine, and Jesus says, this is none of my business. Why are you asking me to do this? It sounds like Jesus is being condescending to his mother. What is that about? I can, I can help you through that. There are things that are in the Bible that you won't inherently understand on the surface. I can help you through that. Use me as a resource to help you understand what God is saying in his word. He wants us to know him better. And if I can help you in that regard, I'd love to do that. Hit me up on Facebook. Uh, post a question to me. I, I'm not on Facebook every day. But uh, the only time I really check out Facebook, I should probably be honest, is when I get an email saying someone is posting something, then I go on and check it out. The best instance is for you to email me. I'm on email every day, mostly all day. So hit me up with a question. Uh, if you'd like to get my number after the service, you can call me. Feel free to do that as well. But God wants us to, to, to be focused on doing God's work, continuing in God's work, and continuing in God's word. Those are the two exhortations that Paul gave to young Timothy, and those are the exhortations that I want to give to you tonight. All right? Let's pray together and ask God to just really make this, these two points that Paul made to, to young Timothy come alive in our heads and in our hearts and as we get busy with our hands as well. Lord, you commanded Paul to instruct Timothy to persist, to continue, to persevere, to endure in the midst of opposition to God's work and to your word. And Lord, I want to challenge our new young church to continue to be all that you've predestined that we be, that you've called us in your word to be as we're ministers, as we're a holy priesthood ministering for you. Lord, may we continue in the things that we've learned and that we've been assured of, that we believed in. And then, Lord, may we continue in your word. The scriptures are breathed out by you. You are their source. May we make them a part of who we are. May they 
become who we are, not what we do, but who we are. But Lord, that won't fall out of the sky. We recognize that. We've We've got to be, we've got to do this with intentionality. We've got to, we've got to set aside quality time to study sacred scripture. So Lord, as we leave this place, Holy Spirit, would you keep it at the forefront of our minds to make your word a priority? May we study, may we read the Bible for all it's worth and know you better and be conformed and be fashioned like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's our desire. Light a fire under us to be that and to do that starting this week. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. So if you'd like help with that, I'm going to stick around after the service and talk about maybe you've, um, maybe you've gotten away from doing God's work and you want to get back connected with that. And, and if I can help you, uh, with that I'd like to know that or if you've fallen away from the Holy Scriptures and you'd like to get back involved with studying God's Word and, and uh, let me know I'd like to give you some, some pointers about how you might do that as well but again I'm your resource and I'd like to just be available I love you and I'd love to see what God is going to do um, in your life as you persist and continue in God's work and His Word Woo! <laughs>